Thank you for attending the Place Your Trades Network Spaces. This Spaces is brought to you by TraderMate, which has a custom web app dedicated to trading CME Group's new daily option contracts, including indices, NRG, metals, and now Bitcoin. You can trade these on the DOM on TraderMate's main platform as well. And they're a great way to get exposure to the futures markets with limited risk. You can go to placeyourtrades.com and get the TraderMate app for free. I also write a weekly blog and daily pre-market overview on the markets that you can subscribe to at placeyourtrades.com. I will be doing a summary of this episode with my key takeaways that will be available to download as a PDF. So if you're interested in getting this PDF, please click on the link on my feed or visit placeyourtrades.com backslash spaces to sign up for it. The PDF will be available and emailed out to anybody that signs up. And just as a reminder before we begin, this material is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not to be construed as a recommendation, solicitation, or an offer to buy or sell, long or short, any securities, commodities, or any related financial instruments. Please contact a licensed professional before making any investment or trading decisions. And with that, I will introduce our guests. First, we have Bill Fleckenstein. Legendary hedge fund manager who called the dot-com bubble in the 1990s and the 2008 collapse. Bill graduated from University of Washington with a major in mathematics and joined the prestigious Wall Street firm Kidder Peabody in 1979. And then in 1982, he launched his own firm. He's written a daily commentary on the market action since 1996. And in 2000. Three, he started FleckensteinCapital.com, where you can sign up for his daily market commentary. He's also a best selling author. His book is titled Greenspan's Bubble The Age of Ignorance at the Federal Reserve, which was published in January of 2008. Next, we have Tabby Costa. Tabby is a member and macro strategist at Crescat Capital. He's been with the firm since 2013. He's responsible for de developing Crestcat's macro models as part of their thematic investment process. His research has been featured in financial publications such as Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Reuters, Yahoo Finance, Real Vision, and others. Before joining Crestcat, he worked for he worked with the underwriting of financial products in international business at Brass Service. I hope I said that right a large logistics company in Brazil. Tabby graduated cum laude from Lindenwood University in St. Louis, my hometown, with a BA degree in business administration with an emphasis in finance. And with that, gentlemen, thank you so much. We'll get started. Um, I do this in a round. And so um, we'll have two rounds each and then a, a final thoughts round. And please, if you have comments on each other's comments, please please feel free to make it as uh, conversational as, as you want to make it. And with that, we'll start with Bill first. We got to talk about FOMC because it's today. So what are your thoughts on Jerome Powell? So far, he's raised rates, fastest in history. Inflation is down. We've yet to see a recession. Um, so, you know, has he won the battle? Do you expect any more rate hikes. I know the market is factoring in pause today. Um, and are, do you foresee a hard landing, soft landing, or a no landing? 
This is uh, a loaded question, I know. <laughs> oh, that's easy. Yeah, I'll just say yes or no. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, and um, um, uh, in any case, to answer your question, um, I, I, it's particularly um, muddy, I think, um, in terms of has he won, um, he hiked rates rather aggressively after completely not understanding the consequences of their policies. So everyone likes to give him credit for what he's done that they perceive to be uh, beneficial, but they don't ever focus on the mistakes that led to the actions. So um, I think that they will not turn out to be successful at having conquered inflation, but that doesn't mean we, it, that we won't see lower inflation readings for a while. Uh, everyone knows about the base effect, and, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that the base effect stays with us prospectively unless we experience deflation that's equal to what the inflation was that came before it. And so uh, everyone talks about how tough Powell is and his legacy and all that, but he hasn't really been tested. He, he was been able to raise rates without much breaking. We saw the banking system start to have problems because of their, uh, you know, all the fixed income they bought when rates were zero. And as Silicon Valley bank blew up, um, you know, instead of like letting the people that were um, uh, exposed um, by having more money than is guaranteed, um, I take a little pain, maybe lose 10% or so, you know, they, they made everyone whole and they, they put, put in the bailout facility so the banks could borrow it at par. So he's already shown that he, he, he'll move if something goes wrong. So I think now that inflation has stopped r ratcheting up aggressively due to the base effect, um, the, if we start to see any kind of weakness or, or have a problem, he will, he will start to cut. The, mar the market has gotten ahead of that, that outcome because so many people, you know, I think are, 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 are making a bet by buying fixed income prospectively, thinking that it will do well when that happens. Um, I'm not so sure how well they'll get paid. And, I, and those, those I, the, as uh, we discussed before, Tracy, those rate cuts aren't really people doing rate cut math. They're just speculators that have bid bonds to a place that 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 if you look forward, you you would you would think that's where the rates are going to be. So, um, anyway, uh, he, he's going to have a prolonged inflation problem, in my opinion. Uh, if you look at see how inflation developed in the '60s and '70s, it wasn't just like one and done. It was a process that took a long time to get totally out of control and took a long time to get back under control. So I think the environment we're in is going to turn out more like to be, to be more like the seventies than most people seem to want to understand. Um, <clears throat> so I guess that's a long way of saying that I think that, uh, that, that we're a long way from knowing how this is all going to play out. And I think expectations are way too optimistic about how um, 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 how, 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 how Goldilocks, lo how Goldilocks-ish the, the environment really is. And why, I mean, why, I mean, Powell's been pretty adamant in his stance higher for longer, yet the market keeps pricing in rate cuts. I, the price, you know, we have a rate cut priced in for March, starting in March. Um, yet the Fed has, you know, still hasn't wavered from their stance. So what, why, why do you think the markets are expecting something different? Well, be, because people, people have all taken it. A lot of speculators have taken a page out of Stan Druckenmiller's book. And everyone knows that, you know, Stan famously has made tons of money in bear markets by betting on fixed income, bear markets and recessions. So a lot of people are trying to get in front of that. I think there are probably other fixed income buyers who um, uh, like this coupon versus what they had to deal with for several years prior. But because they're just, they're, they're just speculating on, on what they think is the certainty of a recession and the fact that inflation is under control. Therefore, they bid bonds to a place that implies these rate cuts. But I don't know that they specifically, anyone saying in their head, hmm, I think he's going to cut three times next year, therefore do this. It's more like they did this and that's what the math implies. 
So, um, and I don't think, look, the rhetoric, if you've read any transcripts, the actual meeting transcripts, not, not the um, minutes that they release, um, you know, at, you know, every, every month or every, a month after all the meetings, um, the, 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 the Fed is not particularly insightful when it comes to any, any, any big changes. Um, you know, Powell was begging for more inflation as recently as, um, July of 19. I, I've got this article pinned to my wall that says Powell seeks a cure for the disease of low inflation, you know, and he was, yeah, he, he said that, you know, and that's why we think it's so important that we defend our 2% inflation goal here in the United States. And we're committed to doing that. So people forget that he was trying to stoke inflation, not understanding what might happen if they did it and if they were successful. And so what I'm saying is you got to look at what he's saying now in light of what he said before. I mean, everyone acts like he's the second coming of, of Paul Boker. And I find that laughable. Well, yeah, I, I mean, do you think that, you know, part of this is his reputation and, and also, you know, what does this look like going into an election year? Because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of political pressure on either to definitely not raise anymore and or cut rates. Do you think he'll uh, kind of kowtow to any sort of political pressure or does he have the wherewithal to keep his stance, so to speak? Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, I think he does care about his legacy. I don't mean to imply that. I just don't think that he has the nerve to do what's going to need to be done it when things get difficult. Like I just cited the example from, from Silicon Valley Bank last spring. So uh, I think if, 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 nothing, if, if nothing changes and stays exactly this today, which, which is not going to be the case, <clears throat> he probably wouldn't be motivated by the election. You know, Janet certainly will be, and she'll be monkeying with the, the TGA and the, and the, and the refunding uh, s schedules you know, all next year, I would imagine. <laughs> but if we start to get an accident or we have a, a, some kind of problem where there's stress, then I think she'll be inclined to play ball. That, and, and at some point, the election may factor into that if they're going to do something anyway. They won't say that, but I think that would be the case. But I don't think the election would be enough to move them off the mark all by itself. And then since you brought up Yellen, that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, you know, what are the thoughts on Yellen really basically counteracting much of what the Fed is doing by issuing bonds? And it looks like she's probably going to be switching to bills. So what does this mean for markets? Well, there's the what does it mean in actuality? And then there's what does it mean from a psychological standpoint? I think um <laughs> Well, um, it, 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 it is the case that she's been skewed, skewing things towards bills um, because that, you know, they're, they're seem to be re they're ready buyers for bills and, and, and all of that <clears throat> versus say longer term paper. Um, I, I think she'll, I think she'll do quote unquote, whatever it takes to try to keep rates from, from uh, going higher next year, anything within her power. Um, Whereas I don't think Powell will be anywhere near that pliable. Having said that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, if there's any kind of a catalyst or reason for him to want to ease, the election may factor it in. But it's going to be Janet's job to try to monkey with things as best she can. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> All right, Bill, we'll come back to you. I want to move over to uh, Tavi. Welcome. Um, I, I sort of had, this is a two-part question, another loaded question. So, well, this kind of the same question I asked, Bill, are you in the hard landing, soft landing, or no landing camp? And also, we are in a period of one of the longest, if not the longest, uh, yield periods of yield curve inversion with no recession yet. So is this time it's different? Are we already in a recession or are we headed for a recession no matter what? Thanks for having me, and it's great to be here uh, to share some of my views as well. Um, um, look, I I've been in the in the hard lending scenario for for a while, and it's not no, um, not a new view uh, for for Crescent at all. We've been structurally bearish on on financial assets that are we we believe are very expensive, and 
I don't think that a lot of those, this sort of what we call the perfusion of macro indicators today, um, you know, pointing to a recession are going to be different this time. I, I do think that this is um, you know, suggesting that there's some, some, uh, some hard landing ahead of us. And uh, you know, I, I think it's one thing to raise interest rates and, and, and tighten monetary conditions in an environment where labor markets have been um, more supportive. And, and I, I, I think that we're, I, I guess, entering a phase now where labor markets are showing some serious signs of the t- deterioration. Um, I think there's a, you know, one of them is, is what's happening with job openings and you know, the collapse of, the, of that index itself. And when you look at the amount of government jobs relative to the overall job openings, uh, which is is increasing and and another sign of of that we tend to see during recessions when private companies are not hiring as much as the government is is an important one. Uh, we've had the unemployment rate as well actually crossing its uh, its, its uh, two year moving average, which is a a signal that has always uh, also predicted recessions in the past and and it marks the beginning of the deterioration in labor markets as well. And another one that it's been starting to move higher. Uh, that is important is is the number of unemployed people uh, for over 15 weeks or longer, and, and it's it's also starting to move higher, uh, or permanent job losses and so forth. So there's no shortage of, of signs. The labor markets are beginning to uh, to weaken significantly, and uh, and you know despite that, I, I think the, the soft landing narrative is is still very prominent, and um, and 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 fair enough. They know that we've had a narrowing leadership in equity markets. Uh, although the S and P 500, um, they've been carried on for for uh, mostly a few stocks, and 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 things are changing, even from a, a capital a capital spending perspective. Um, you know, back in the days, we used to see capital intensive industries like utilities, energy, materials, really carrying most of the capital spending in this in in the economy. And now we're we're actually shifting towards technology being the most capital intensive sector of the economy, which is quite interesting because that kind of changes the nature of cyclicality of that of those companies as we see, you know, the this desperate need for more capital to generate less growth uh, as we kind of hit this exhausted uh period of, of of growth in most of those those mega cap companies that have already already, you know, a, a huge part of the economy. There was not much more to grow here. Um, so, you know, the reason why perhaps we haven't seen a recession just yet is potentially just the, the delay of, of monetary conditions, the, the normal lagging effects of, of that. And, um, and I think that, that as we see effect of interest rates beginning to rise, which just means as we have maturing debt obligations and most institutions and sovereign institutions will start to actually reissue those, uh, those obligations in, in, in 2024 and 2025, uh, at much higher interest rates, I think that that's going to have, uh, uh, you know, the real impact of, of liquidity. And uh, a chart that I posted yesterday with VIX at, you know, at, at, at 12 or 13, you know, this is real side of complacency today in the markets, given how much we've been into this, this kind of hiking cycle already, along with quantitative tightening as well, which is, uh, to me, even more important. And, and the divergence between central bank assets relative to um, to uh, to overall equity markets, which I think it's uh, it's also something uh, starking as well that, it, that people should be uh, uh, paying attention to. Oh, and why why do you think exactly markets have been so complacent? Because you brought up volatility, um, you know, and it seems though it's disappeared. Right, we're at lows of the lows. What are we at? Eleven or something? Um, so, what what do you think is the main catalyst for this? Uh, complacency. Well, I think it's easy to speak in hindsight, and I wish I, I had that view as well a year ago. But uh, you know, number one, I think things have uh, you know the euphoria of of AI has been has been a big one certainly, and and I think we've uh, we've missed this uh, this big run up in in mega cap companies uh, that I didn't think would be you know sustainable and and, and driven by. Uh, this wave of uh, of an euphoric narrative. Um, number two, I think there was sentiment was very negative in in 2022 at the end of it, um, and potentially I think that certainly uh, created a you no know, folks to be off uh, you know off footed in terms of, of positioning and 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 created this rally that we've had in in this uh, year to date. But although you know again being very um, uh, minded that that's this is uh, this is not the overall market. It's it's really driven mostly by those those large companies. Uh, those are I think the, the the big the big things. And uh, inflation certainly decelerated, right? Inflation decelerated 
uh, which I think has helped the market to, uh, to prop up the markets too. And, um, you know, look back in the seventies when inflation accelerated, certainly it was, was, uh, uh, was something that supported the equity market. It's now you ask my view about inflation is, is very, uh, similar, uh, to other folks that, that are in an inflation camp. I, I think, I think we are facing, at, uh, you know, a lot of, of very structural problems in terms of that. And, uh, that has to do with what I call pillars of inflation and, and it's, um, and those are, you know, the reckless amount of fiscal spending, the deglobalization issues that we're seeing uh, that are, I think are you know, a huge problem. Um, and a third one would be the chronic underinvestments in, in natural resources, which has been my main focus as well. And the funds has been certainly looking for exposure towards that in the labor markets. And I say, I do think the labor markets are, are showing uh, signs that are very similar to the 1970s in terms of the um, you know, just the, the the fact that folks are are struggling to to live in an environment of of higher cost of uh, of living and and uh, and so forth, and it will pressure those folks to actually uh, you know earn more capital. And and as we see companies actually being squeezed by their margins, because when you look at the the amount of labor cost relative to uh, to how much you know companies are earning in revenues and other things you will see clearly that we're in one of the lowest levels in history. So companies certainly have room to pay more to their employees. And, and that's going to change the dynamic of margins as we move forward. And, and it's important just, you know, if you just look at historically of margins of corporations in the U.S., you know, all we've done in the last uh, two years or so is go back to peak levels of, 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 of prior, um, you know, of prior cycles, meaning you know, we we were at outstanding levels of, of margins that now came back down, and that contraction is is only back to our prior peak levels of, of prior to the the technology bubble or 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 the housing bubble and other periods that were very uh, robust until things really turn. And so, um, you know, so we haven't really seen this contraction uh, uh, from from margins that really uh, it starts to uh, to hurt those businesses, and I, I think we're going to see that. I, I really believe that uh, labor cost and 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 deglobalization, other things, are going to create uh, you know further implications for those companies to make money. And so, uh, and a deceleration of of growth is is certainly happening now, and I I think uh, we're starting to see that from the labor markets, as I pointed out before. Uh, manufacturing is starting to show some some issues as well. I, I've been showing issues for a while. I mean, the manufacturing new orders uh, have been you know consecutively below fifty for uh, for over you know twelve or fourteen months already. So you know, there's certainly signs there as well of of, of weakness. So you know, strongly that this is uh, the reason the recession uh, really necessarily mean the the, the problem. You're cutting out just a little bit. Something that should be in mind of most investors. Does that mean that? Does that mean the Fed is going to have to accept higher inflation rates, and we won't get to the two percent? In your opinion, did you hear me? Well, I think that's going to be the case. <laughs> yes, yes, I, I do believe that will be the case, and uh, you know, I think we are in the trifecta of macro imbalances. We have. Uh, in makers will have to allow inflation to. Be cutting out just a little bit. Are you in a bad in, in spot? A that you, we have companies trading at 150 times. Sorry. Yeah, I think you're Can cutting. You hear me okay? Keep cutting out a little bit. No, you keep cutting out a little bit. Is your reception okay? Can you hear me better now? Is that better? Yes, much better. Okay, switch to, uh, okay, perfect. Um, uh, so your question was regarding, uh, can you repeat your question again? Sorry. Yeah, so the question was, is the Federal Reserve going to have to accept higher inflation rate than Oof. their percent goal? Oh, I, I do think that that will be the case. And I, I don't think we have much of a way around this. I, I love talking about what the Fed is going to do in, in two to three hours, but that's that's sort of, you know, meaningless in, in, a, in a sense of, uh, of, of what the opportunity that Liza had in terms of the, the imbalances that we have. You know, why, why even, you know, allocate capital towards technology companies trading at 50, 100 times earnings when you have 
natural resource companies trading, you know, even privately businesses trading at one times free cash flow in some cases. It's it's really crazy what's going on. I, I you know, I, I find this one of the best opportunities I've seen in my career. So, you know, this is why I'm, I'm completely focused in that part of the market. But uh, nonetheless, you know, to answer the question, um, and I, I do think that, you know, the imbalances we have are too large to not allow inflation to run hotter than, than historical standards. And, and, and if I'm right about inflation, having those pillars very entrenched in the economy and, and really, you know, developing through waves as we usually see, not only in the 70s, but in the 40s, in the 1910s, all those things develop through waves. Um, and that's just the, the reason for it is basic facts and other things that cause, you know, acceleration and deceleration of, of, of consumer prices. And so, um, you know, if we have those things really established, uh, and those things meaning legalization, chronic underinvestments in, in natural resources, uh, labor costs, and, and reckless amount of fiscal spending, and all sorts of things creating and propping up prices of, of, of consumers' uh, goods and services. Uh, you know, it, it's just hard to believe that that's not going to uh, remain the case, given how much leverage we have in the system and how much valuations have been driven, uh, you know, in a, one of the most speculative environments we've seen. I mean, Cape Ratio is at 30 and people don't even steal it, right? I mean, it's like this other guy mentioned in my, uh, on a tweet that I posted yesterday, uh, you know, what do you define as absurd valuations? I mean, isn't that obvious? I mean, you know, it's just, but people have been just conditioned to living in an environment of low interest rates, low cost of capital, and propping up valuations to levels that we really, you know, have only seen in the late 90s, in the late 20s. And so, you know, how does that all end? Well, it ends, you know, I, a lot of times ends with a large crash. And, and unfortunately, you know, uh, I, I feel like a lot of, of folks are going to get caught up on that. And, and you may say, well, that's a doom and gloom way of, of thinking about the world. But I think there's just much better opportunities out there to be focused on. And, you know, the fact that we have, you know, a 14% weight in Apple and Microsoft today in, in, in S&P 500, almost 20% of those, the index, uh, NASDAQ 100 is, is in those two companies. Uh, and if you look at S&P alone, you know, that's more than four sectors combined, you know, that's, that's more than utilities, energy, materials. You know, and and so forth, and it's just it's just um, you know unsustainable what we're seeing, and and um, you know dynamic of capital shifts at, at some point, and, and you you likely to see things that have been in favor to become favor again, and so you know why you know to me it's just kind of uh, nonsense to even um, to even um, you know spend effort and and and, and capital uh, you know towards this 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 part of the economy. I'm I'm really focused on natural resources because I think it's going to be. Uh, one of the best opportunities we've seen and, and hard assets in general are likely to do very well. I'm going to add the next round. That's all I'm talking about with you. I just wanted to get, get through the, the equities part of this, but next the next round is um, all my questions are on, on commodities. So we'll definitely dig into that. Um, but my last question is for right now um, is you, you did actually posted a chart the other day that shows that U S is near extreme peaks versus global equities. So do you think that, and that's even higher than the 2000, uh, 2000 tech bubbles. And I am just, I'm posting it to Twitter right now so people can see what I'm talking about, what you're talking about. Um, so just, I mean, do you think this, is, how does this end? Or how do you well, think it'll end? You know, I think the issue with my uh, analysis and my charts, unfortunately, is that people use them as as uh, as as trading advice, and certainly isn't right. It's just uh, research for long term research of uh, of of my views about markets in, in general. And what I view about that chart specifically is is reflects not only you know this unsustainable valuations we have of U.S. businesses relative to other parts of the world. Um, you know, if you want to be more specific about what the opportunities are that lie ahead, you know, some folks may say the short side looks very compelling. I would say that the long side of resource abundant economies is even further or uh, even more interesting to me. You can buy a business in, in Brazil, uh, you know, very established for over 30 years trading at, at four or five times earnings uh, that is highly linked to the commodity space and so forth. And I think that that's, that's really uh, you know, setting the stage for emerging markets, particularly the ones, as I said, that have resource favorable economies uh, to really perform much better than developed economies. And, 
And so I'm, I'm really focused in that part of the, of, 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 of the overall global economy. Cause I think that that's where most of the opportunities are going to lie ahead in, in the near future. And, you know, it's, it's, it's supposedly it's, it's kind of how, how it works in, in terms of, uh, of capital allocation and, and portfolio allocation in general. You know, if you look at 60, 40 portfolios, how much of them are allocated towards emerging markets today, or even how much of them are allocated towards hard assets or commodities, you know, there's a reason where they're called 60, 40, because they don't have any any allocations towards other asset classes. And so, you know, as we see an environment where inflation stays uh, sustainably higher uh, historically and, and bottoms at, at, at levels that we've, you know, that, that are supposedly uh, higher than, than the targets for most central banks, you know, if, if, we're, if, we're, if we're really bottoming at 2 to 3% versus bottoming at 0%, as we've seen in, in prior uh, cycles, uh, then what does that mean? You know, that means potentially, you know, uh, uh, commodities could do very well. And you can see, do the same exactly chart and look at commodities to equity ratios that also look, you know, completely out of balance. Or you can look at emerging markets specifically relative to um, to, uh, to U.S. equities. You're also going to find the same thing. Or, or how about growth versus value, right? And so all those things are, are themes or thematic ideas that are probably going to work in, in the near, in, in, I think in the next 10 years, that look very compelling. Um, the energy sector that you cover so well, um, you know, that's, that's another part of the, of, of, of the markets that are, are likely to be, um, you know, uh, uh, doing very well in the next, in, in the next uh, five to 10 years that offers a lot of op opportunities. And so, um, yeah, so I think that that's what reflects in this chart is, is really, you know, as we, as we get into this inflationary era, you want to own businesses that have purchasing power and commodity businesses have an inherent purchasing power because hard assets tend to rise during those periods. And what you tend to see is, is that they actually perform very well. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's, there are reasons to own those companies in particular times in history that, that are specific for that. And, and I think we're in another one of those and majority of the people that are um, avoiding emerging markets and other things are really with the lenses of what happened in the prior decades. And, and, and that doesn't really matter. The, the, the fact that it has underperformed is precisely the reason it should be uh, on your radar. Excellent. Thank you. And we'll come back to you to talk commodities. Um, back over to Bill. Uh, Bill, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Japan, moving over to another central bank. What are your thoughts on BOJ right now? Um, are they going to raise rates? Are they going to stay? And then your thoughts on then the yen? Well, um, it seems to me, and this is guesswork because we don't know for sure, but it seems to be knowing how the, the Bank of Japan and, and Japan in general tends to operate, they have been, they've been winking and nodding for some time now that that they're going to not, that they're going to let yield, cur yield curve control go, yield curve control go away. They have moved the bands and, um, um, they've kind of hinted and then taken it back that maybe, you know, that'll end and, and behind the scenes made some noise about, uh, a potential, um, hiking cycle. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, James Aitken, who follows us much close, much more closely than I do and has great contacts there, uh, feels that, that the bank, the, the big surprise of 24 is going to be that the Bank of Japan uh, begins an actual rate hiking cycle, which I don't think people are prepared for. That would, uh, in my opinion, trigger a fair amount of repatriation of capital home to Japan. It would upset those carry traders that are funding their speculative trades, most likely fixed income, um, in yen. Uh, and so it would have the potential to uh, obviously be a big deal in the FX market with the yen rallying. And I think it would be another headwind for treasuries here in America. Uh, some people who have speculated on the uh, of this uh, on this sort of a, an outcome for Japan have have sort of implied that it might be the end of the world for everything. I, I, I don't, I don't really, I don't really mean to imply that at all. I think it would be, it would be, uh, it cause the yen to strengthen. It would be a, another headwind for treasuries by extension. It might matter to equities here. Um, you know, if some people got caught in that blow up, maybe that might lead to something, 
But I believe it's taken as long as it has is because Japan, it, it, the, the people at the BOJ and the MOS want to make sure that the big entities in Japan don't get caught offside. In other words, they don't want to have a rerun of what happened to Silicon Valley Bank and was going to happen to a bunch more banks here last spring as rates rose enough to really cause their balance sheets to be badly impaired. So I think that's what they're trying to do. That's why they've stretched it out as long as they have. And uh, so, so that, that's, that's sort of my scenario for Japan. And then I'd like to have your thoughts on China right now. Obviously, the property sector is still a disaster. So do you see this as kind of a controlled demolition um, or is it actually worse than we thought? Because, you know, everybody looks to China, particularly for commodities, well, for work, for, for demand and for growth, right? So China's growing. The global economy is growing is well, sort of what people think so where where do you, where do you, where does china sit with you right now well you're gonna laugh when i tell you this but um i made up my mind about 20 years ago when 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 china was first starting to become a, a factor that i didn't trust any of their data uh nor th their intentions about what they would let us know and so i made it I decided I was not going to let it factor into my decision making much because I just didn't really trust the data or my ability to analyze the data that I didn't know if it was any good or not. So I don't, I try not to have a, therefore I try not to have a big opinion on China. There are, there are lots of people who you can read and follow who are sort of plugged in there. I, I haven't followed it closely enough to know who's really the best at it or the handful of folks who are the best at it. So, but anyway, I mean, ob obviously they're having problems after getting away with as much stimulus and command, com command economy directives that they were, they were given. And for, for a long time, it looked like, you know, the, the excesses were going to be able to be, the can was going to be able to be kicked indefinitely. And now it's starting to matter and how much it matters and how they deal with it. I just can't say, and not knowing that I, I I, 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 I don't have, again, I don't have much of an insight. I just think, you know, what, what, whatever, what, whatever strong view that you, 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 that you have, that's a consequence of what you can glean. I just, I just don't, wouldn't hold any views too strongly about China. So that's kind of a non-answer answer, but that's why, that's why I look at it the way I do. That makes sense. And then, um, what are your thoughts on uh, the U.S. markets right now, we have this pervasive bid, right? And you, people kind of pass a bid. Maybe you could go into that a little bit and, and kind of explain sure. what that means. Sure, because it's a very, very important variable. And um, I, uh, I'll just take a step back. Um, it, for a number of years, you know, like, say, 18 to 20, uh, and particularly in 19 and 20, uh, or sorry, 19 and early 20, I could not. And, and, and then even after the, the, uh, the big break in 20, I couldn't figure out why the market seemed not to look forward anymore. And it didn't seem to discount anything. It was like reacting to the news. And I kept, I, I couldn't put, I couldn't figure out why that was the case. It was drove me crazy. And then sometime in the, then in the, in, in early 2020, I bumped into Mike Green who had done all this research on the uh, amount of money that is uh, uh, under control by passive investors. And when I say passive investors, and so, and so everything I know about that is I learned from Mike Green and then can continued reading. So he's the man that really uh, understands this stuff as well as anyone. So I don't want to take credit for his work. Um, but when I, when I say the passive bid, I don't mean an ETF, because, you know, while you, when you buy an ETF, somebody goes out and buys the names and the weightings as proscribed, but you made an active decision to buy that ETF. The passive bid is this. In corporate America, there are these target date funds and they have a certain amount of equities and a certain amount of fixed income, depending on your age. And that money gets shipped to BlackRock and Vanguard and is run uh, almost exclusively these days in a passive form. That's not to say there's no money with outside, with, with different types of money managers, but that's, 
that's what's taking all the incremental market share. And it's somewhere around 50% of, 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 of daily activity. Well, so you have a machine, a robot who says, I have cash, I'm buying them. And they buy it in the prescribed waiting of the Vanguard or the BlackRock or whoever else might be doing that. And it's, it's mechanical, it has nothing to do with any view on anything. Jack Bogle started this by thinking that, that you could have a lower cost way to uh, mimic the market. And the market used to be the collective wisdom of all the investors. And it used to be very good at discounting the future. You know, in various industries would start down well before the news turned, the market itself. It was a great discounting mechanism. That has ceased to be the case for, I don't know, at least five or six years, if not longer. And the passive bid keeps taking market share in that at the margin, uh, active managers get redeemed. Um, and part of that's demographics and part of that's underperformance. So the passive bid keeps taking a bigger and bigger share. And at some point it will, it will, it will dislocate, sorry, it'll, it'll impact the heavier weighted stocks even more disproportionately than it does today. I mean, that's one, uh, one of the reasons why we have these mega caps is that's one of the phenomenon. So it makes uh, uh, trying to ferret out what the market's going to do or doing very difficult because it's like the market that used to look down the road and see the future has kind of been sedated, right? It's all drugged up, you know, uh, uh, just coming out of surgery. You know, use that, that, that visual if you want. Um, and then on top of that, you have the massive amount of money that's in the uh, option-oriented world. And there's plenty of fellows on, uh, and gals on Twitter that, that know a lot about that. But that also amplifies things and, 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 and moves uh, individual securities disproportionately relative to the news. So um, th that, that creates risks. Th th those create certain risks, but they also create a certain amount of automatic pilotness to the, to the process. So I'm explaining this because people need to understand the nature of the beast. This is not the market that I grew up with, nor existed prior to that. Um, and uh, so you have, to, you have to keep that in mind when you're thinking about outcomes and how things can play out. Um, so I, I got off on such a tangent about passive investing. I forgot what the other part of the question was. Sorry. Well, so I, I, well, that, that was just, I just wanted you to kind of explain that. And then okay. uh, maybe some of the dangers of this, uh, meaning, you yeah. know, what if we do go into a recession and we do see people well, starting to pull money from their 401k? Yeah. Well, um, uh, according to Mike Green, who heard comment on this yesterday, um, it, we need a certain amount of, of, of contraction, uh, um, or certainly lack of growth in the employment, I mean, in the employment market to start to, to start to, um, move that bid in a way that might matter or reduce that bid or God, or potentially turn to selling. Um, obviously, um, th th that presents, presents a big risk to the downside because it will be just as indiscriminate in selling as it has been in buying. So if some event comes along that, that it, it would have to happen in a moment in time when the flows were reduced by some uh, a reduction in the levels of employment, but it, it could mean that we could get, you know, you know some really nasty uh, action in the stock market and it could fall a long way in a short space of time. That would also be exacerbated by the option flows. So you have to, you have to be aware of both of these variables and have them factor into your decision making because if we get to a point where there's you know there's employment erosion enough you, then and you have to be aware of is it is it is it low is it down enough to start matter to these flows and if it is do you need to reduce your risk i think it would be wise to do that when we get to that juncture assuming we do but you you, you, you it's not something i think that's easily anticipated cuz you know it may go on for 9 months or 2 years or may start to change in a couple of months I don't think you can anticipate very well until you start to see signs that it's occurring. And then uh, one last question before I go back to Tavi. We have U.S. financial conditions, the most accommodative they've been since the Fed started raking heights. Uh, now I can't talk. Hiking rates last year. 
Um, yet, you know, we have uh, rate hikes and we have QT. So what is, you know, why are we seeing this divergence? Yeah. <laughs> why are we? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think I think part of the fact part of it is, is the fact that there's these passive flows have still been there. I would argue if those passive flows weren't there. The market would have already weakened up. There have been enough signs of recession in certain industries and enough weakness. The market would have started down already. That combined with weaker news would start a feed on itself, affect psychology and beat business decisions. And it would help sort of reflexively uh, uh, um, the market and the economy would, 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 would work back and forth to, you know, contribute to weakness. So I think part of it has been the passive bid and these uh, option flows uh, have helped hold the market together. So it did better than folks would have imagined um, with the rapid rise in, in hikes. And, and, and then, um, so obviously stocks going up creates more wealth. And so that, that helps. So I think it's really been this, the, the, the size of the passive bid has helped psychology uh, a little bit and wealth a little bit. And and um, made it such that, made it so that the the rise in rates hasn't been a, enough of an impact. I mean, also got to remember they bailed out Silicon Valley Bank and all these other banks. So we are about to have a come to Jesus moment with uh, all the um, assets held to maturity in the regional banks, and then poof, they made it go away. Right? Well, I mean that's still there lurking. You've still got lots of problems headed for commercial real estate. You've got lots of probably bad marks in venture, uh, uh, so-called private equity and all of that. So there's, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, um, potential problems beneath the surface of the iceberg that we can see a little bit of, but none of them has started to come together, but we could easily get into a moment in time in 24 where they all coalesce and, and the wrong things happen and you, you can have a, a huge drawdown in the market. I'm not saying it will happen. I'm just saying, again, you have to be aware of these things, even if you can't do much about them today. Matt makes get buy protection. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't done that yet. I plan to do that, but I'm trying, you know, when you're, when obviously timing matters a lot when you're buying something that'll expire. Um, but I plan to do that at some point. I'd like to see some signs of turmoil or I'd like to have some sense of the reason to act rather than, okay, it's so cheap. I got to do it. Um, that generally it doesn't work out so well for me um, when I'm speculating. I'd rather see some sign that, okay, it's time to start thinking about this at least a little bit. But yes, that's one thing you could do if, if you felt that the time was right. Excellent. Thank you. Now back to Tavi. Let's talk commodities. So COP28 just ended. Countries reinforced their commitment to green transition. No shocker there. Um, so why do you think that uh, renewable minerals and metals have underperformed so much, considering the lack of CapEx across the sector and the West, uh, you know, seemingly down this path, uh, you know, with no stopping? Mm. That's a good question. I think it has to do mostly with the misallocation of capital also in the natural resources space, believe it or not. Uh, we've, well, we, we talk with institutions about where to invest. Majority of the questions were, were targeted towards lithium and other things. And, you know, the lack of understanding of those markets is, is it's, it's, it's actually uh, starking. And it's, it's, you know, I think, you know, in our view, a lot of the valuation of the companies in the lithium space and projects that folks were uh, bidding, uh, it were certainly not projects that we would be doing, uh, you know, advancing at all. I mean, things are, they're probably uh, shouldn't be economical uh, whatsoever and, and, and not environmentally uh, clean in, at all as well. And so um, we certainly um, avoided a lot of those, those, uh, those things that there was almost like a bubble inside of Pen the resources space, believe it or not, um, which was caused by the valuation of some of those more uh, famous or popular battery metals. Um, with that aside, um, you know, there's certainly 
um, and things have uh, cleaned up a bit um, more recently. And and there are some great projects, by the way, in 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 the battery metals space. And we've been we've been financing some of those in, in different parts of the world. Um, but um, but it's it's you know you have to look with the lenses of of, of a bear market, meaning um, always always looking for things that are um, that are very good projects that can be developed in in any type of of, of market. And and I think. Um, a lot of folks are not uh, approaching this the right way. And to me, it's it's almost like a sense of, uh, I always talk about this, about this, the lack of geologists in, in, in the industry. And, and, and that certainly is reflecting on the inefficiencies of these markets. And, you know, we have a lot of companies that we own that certainly uh, put out great results in terms of uh, intercepts and, and improving the intrinsic value or the probability of a discovery of, of their projects. And... You know, and those companies get um, demolished on those news. It, it's just a, a total lack of understanding of of uh, of, of the market overall, and and so it's allowing you know uh, funds and and other institutions to take a long term approach and buying those businesses that are you know in a completely broken market. In my view, um, you know, there are companies that shouldn't be public. For instance, you know, there's too many public companies in the in the junior space. Um, you know, certainly we could uh, we could fix some of those. There's too, the, some of those companies are too segregated as well. I mean, it's a, you know, why do we have so many companies? Why do we, you know, in, in, in areas that they should be all uh, merged um, and, and it's making it difficult for uh, majors to approach those companies? Because if they approach one of those companies, they, they really need to, in, in, uh, in, in theory, um, approach all of them together, and and it's, it makes it very difficult for them to uh, acquire those those uh, those uh, that land, and so um, in a significant way to uh, to make the waves. And so um, you know, there's a lot of structural problems as well in in this in this industry, but uh, uh, but that's what it makes it so attractive. And do, what are your thoughts on you know? I know that there are a lot of desires to. Uh, you know, bring kind of mining back to North America, yet we have a real big problem with permitting. So is there a way to sort of streamline that? Do you think that's possible? Or are these projects just going to, uh, you know, remain in this very long timeline? Um no, I, I can speak for exposure in the portfolio because I, I think that certainly explains my conviction of what, where we think things are going to develop. And yes, I think North America has, you know, incredible projects to be uh, uh, developed over time. And, it, you know, the, the, the government issues are a big problem. And what is interesting about this market currently is that you have a premium in valuations of projects that are in North America relative to other parts of the world. And that premium is normal. It's is is how markets are prioritizing jurisdiction risk. And so, you know, a project in Bolivia should be priced lower than a project in in the U.S. And that's basically with a sense of of how much the political risk in Bolivia is much larger than the U.S. Okay, well, that in a sense makes kind of sense. However, markets change their level of priori prioritization as we get into the cycle. But what I think it's going to happen here is the fact that you can. You can approve and get something into production in South America much quicker than North America today. You know, in Canada, you're dealing with natives and and other groups that are that, that make it very difficult to uh, to advance a lot of those projects. Uh, you know, some of you know to go from exploration to a producing asset in Canada today, it may take over oh, over 15 years to go there. So you basically lost, missed the whole gold cycle if if uh, if uh, if we if we're entering one today. Um, and so. You know, it is something to be considering. And so as we see, I believe that that premium of, of jurisdiction risk is going to be squeezed, meaning I think we're going to actually prioritize how soon we can get things into production. And so that's why I think South America would be uh, a great place to be uh, to be in, uh, investing in, to be uh, finding those unique projects that can get developed much quicker. And that's a very unexplored region of the world. And uh, believe it or not, and there's there's definitely a lot of opportunities there, and uh, um, you know I think that the the political risk is a real problem, and 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 everything has a price. However, um, the big thing here is 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 the fact that things are so cheap, um, and uh, and and you can certainly on the back of a favorable commodity market, 
um, it's very difficult to see the political side of it uh, getting in the way. And you know, usually you don't see that. I mean, Lula was the president in Brazil back in the early 2000s in the middle of a commodity cycle. And nobody cared about that. You know, the market still went up significantly. And so, you know, we're again with Lula in, in leadership in Brazil, and it's just one example. And it's, um, but if there are other examples in South America, and, and, you know, we've been exposing ourselves more and more in that region because we think that the prioritization of developing assets quicker would be, uh, um, you know, something that would be, um, you know, under uh, consideration more and more for investors moving forward. Given, given this, um, you know, kind of demand that we're going to have for metals and mining that I think it's almost impossible to see how do we go from a green revolution that you mentioned, you know, housing affordability, which just means building more homes, you know, reshoring the economies and, and building factories and building airports and all sorts of things and manufacturing capabilities without making the metals and mining industry a lot more relevant than it is currently and without creating much more demand for those materials over time. And as we see that in, you know, this, this large demand coming over time, uh, certainly will create the need for, uh, you know, the speed of those projects to come into production much quicker. And so we may see that prioritization and a squeeze of margins between, you know, a, a project in North America versus South America. This is just one example, by the way. And then I know you talk about gold a lot, so I can't have you up here without talking about gold. So, you know, why do you think, you know, gold's been relatively sideways for, uh, you know, since 2020, we kind of get to that, you know, 2100 level and then it gets pushed back down. So uh, what are your thoughts on gold longer term and why do you think this market's been relatively stagnant? Oh, I, I think, um, I think it's been a lot of reasons why it's been it's been uh, potentially stagnant, but it's you know, we were kind of in the midst of a lot of changes of correlations in markets overall, and uh, and and this in this change of allocations don't happen very quickly. A lot of those firms, uh, I'm referring to 6040 portfolios, pension funds, and even central banks, they have their own mandates and it takes time to uh, to see the, those big changes reflected in the markets, and so. Uh, gold has been performing very well and, and performing much better than other assets and, and, and significantly changing the way it has been behaving relative to, let's just say, bonds overall, or let's just say tips, uh, tips market as well. Um, you know, a lot of things that used to be highly correlated to gold have been, um, have been changing over, uh, I would say, in the last uh, 12, tw 24 months or so. You know, who would have thought that we would see such a large you know, steep amount of hiking cycle uh, that doesn't really cause, um, you know, uh, gold to completely crash. And, and gold actually held up really well in this in this whole period. And so, you know, there's the other side of this as well that I think a lot of people are uh, avoiding to speak about. It's been of my view that, you know, I think gold prices are going to trade much higher 10 years from now. So, you know, how do you approach a market like this? I mean, you, you know, just think about it. Well, if you think gold's going to be significantly higher in 10 years, um, you know, I want to leverage that trade. I want to think about how do I make money the, mo the most uh, optimal way in this in this market. And, and you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, you can buy silver. You can buy other um, other precious metals. It, it, you can uh, uh, you can you know I've never seen a gold cycle that doesn't coincide with a commodity cycle. You know, believe it or not, agricultural commodities move very close to gold prices. Believe it or not, put the same chart in the same uh, uh, in this in in, in uh, put the two lines in the same chart, and you will find it. Uh, that they actually very close. Same goes for copper. You know, I've never seen a gold cycle that doesn't coincide with a copper cycle. And so, um, yes, copper is more volatile, and there's some other technicalities there. But they're, you know, in most times, they're basically in the same trend. Um, and the same thing goes for emerging markets and other things. And so, you know, when you start thinking about, okay, I have a bullish view in gold. I think. You know, policymakers are very constrained. They, they can't do much. They can't be raising rates sustainably uh, much further. And, you know, we have a lot of imbalances that will cause them to ultimately go back to financial repression and other things. Um, and tangible assets are likely to do very well. Well, I know from a capital dynamic that central banks used to own close to 80% of gold relative to the international reserve. And today they own 20%. They're starting to buy you know, and then you look at the 60-40 portfolios and you see researches from Bank of America asking their financial advisors, how much do you own of gold? And 73% of them say we own 0 to 1% exposure. Um, and then 0% of them own more than 10% exposure to gold. So, you know, 
the, the asymmetry from that side of it looks really attractive. Okay, well, all that is checking my boxes and you know, I'm really uh, getting more bullish. And, and then I looked at global production of gold and I looked at the majors actually trying to sell their projects of gold because you know they're looking to invest in battery metals because their shareholders are asking them to do so and and you know look at most of the gold major companies actually spinning off some of their businesses uh, in in the space and and look at the production of gold itself it's been declining um, and and then match that with prior gold cycles you know in the 70s and the early 2000s both cycles actually coincided with global production of gold falling so you know you start kind of putting all this together. Um, with my views on inflation and also views of, of G7 economies, you know, really having to build up their manufacturing capabilities. And, and if we see that, it's going to be similar to what we saw back with China entering the WTO in the early 2000s and creating demand for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for commodities and more deglobalized environment, at least more than what we've had in the last two to three decades. All those things put together, you know, makes to me, um, you know, very compelling case for gold. So, you know, what what are most of the billionaires that make capital, you know, made, made their wealth in, in the space? Well, if you research, you're going to find that most of them made money in exploration. Or guess what? Nobody's spending money on on, on exploration today. Um, and so exploration stocks have been demolished and, you know, completely diluted. And, and investors have been tired of, of investing in, in that segment of the industry. And guess, you know, th those are things that are kind of cool words for activism, you know, of somebody coming into the space and, and trying to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to create value, unlock value through, uh, through buying the press and, and highly distressed assets, uh, that potentially have, uh, much higher intrinsic value than the market is, is currently, um, um, you know, pricing in. And so, you know, this is the whole reason why I've been, I've been doing this, uh, uh, sort of a uh, fun strategy. Um, and I think there's a lot more things to do, and especially in the private equity and the private market in general, um, where the valuations are even more distressed. And, you know, institutions love distress opportunities in a big way. And I think that ultimately we're going to see some of that capital flowing into the space. And, you know, we're seeing some of that happen through energy companies, as you cover well. And um, we've had uh, some energy companies, you know, dig their toes into mining. Um, auto companies are starting to deep their toes into mining too. And, and as we see central banks doing the same, I think things are going to look very, uh, very interesting as we see liquidity coming back to the space. And then one last question before we do the final round. I want to ask your thoughts on silver because it's one of my interests. Uh, given that it's not only just a precious metal, but it's also an industrial metal as well, particularly with regards to its usage in renewable technologies, such as EV and solar panels. And in fact, renewables make up 45% of the current silver consumption. So, you know, what are your views on that this market, given that it trades so erratically? Oh, talk about trading erratically. Yes, it's, uh, you know, it's almost like a troubled child, but it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great opportunity. I mean, it's it's it, it's one of those things that encompasses a lot of different um, parts of the of 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 macro imbalances and opportunities. Meaning, it, it's a monetary metal. Um, you know, it, it performs well during inflation. If you think about you know gold cycles, gold, silver often leads the way to the upside during those cycles. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's also, as you mentioned, part of the green revolution, it's becoming more and more of that, uh, as it becomes higher in prices that the price is actually elevated, um, you know, it will become more of a monetary metal relative to an industrial metal the same goes for gold, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to find, uh, primary silver assets in the world today. You know, it's, it's not very easy to find We know for a fact that silver discoveries have been very difficult to find. But we we actually had one uh, in in in, uh, in Bolivia uh, recently that we found, and and it's going to be uh, a very interesting one for this next decade. But it, it they, those are rare; they're, they're very difficult to find high grade discoveries of silver uh, that are economical today, and um and 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 that's that's what makes this so, so such a compelling thesis. And so uh, you know when you have gold to silver ratio at about eighty. Uh, in an environment where I believe strongly we're about to break out on gold and see much 
bigger inflows of capital towards the metal. Uh, you know, is there anything better than owning silver and, and looking for silver in the ground? I don't think so. You know, this is why, um, you know, when I, I also get caught up on conversations about the Fed and, and Fang stocks and all the imbalances we see, but man, I much rather spend time on, on, you know, on, on understanding what's the best opportunities in the space right now, because, you know, clearly uh, nobody is is doing that right now. And it's, so it's um, it's really attractive. And so I love silver. I think it's the cheapest asset on uh, on earth right now when it comes to a, a macro asset. And and uh, and the fact that it, you know, that it hasn't worked uh, recently, it doesn't doesn't make me uh, disfavor it at all. It, it's like now I've actually uh, I think that the fact that it hasn't uh, come down or anything like that, and it doesn't have a lot of, uh, I think it has, in my view, a very limited downside, uh, makes me want to take more risk to the upside on on different things that I can express that view in the markets through the miners and so forth. And so this is why I get really excited about that. Excellent. Can I, uh, can I chip in here for one sec? Absolutely. I, I, I'm with both of you. Uh, I'm, I, I think silver has got, uh, is, 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 a, is a great, um, got a great fundamental story. And if, and when we finally get a bull market that gets a little rambunctious on the upside, silver will be a, uh, absolute screamer. And as Kavi can say, tell you, there aren't that many choice silver uh, companies uh, out there, there are a few, and and as everything in that sector, there, there you can find some that are pretty reasonably priced. So I just wanted to give my two cents in the sector. I was a lead director at Pan American Silver for about um, fifteen years, so I've followed the industry for a long time. Excellent. Oh, I wish we had gotten into that in my other interview with well, you. <laughs> um, all right, so the fi here's the final round, you guys. It's the very same question for both of you. You can either talk about something that we didn't cover that you would like to talk about and or what should we as investors be particularly paying attention to, say, over the next, you know, 12 to 24 months? And we'll start with Bill. Well, I would just <clears throat> point out that <clears throat> these risk factors that I discussed that are kind of below the surface are things to keep on your radar. So if you, if you have to, if it becomes a moment where it might be prudent to be less long or, or, or put in some shorts or some hedges, you have to be aware of this, these big, slow moving, big picture dynamics that are always the proverbial slowly than all at once kind of issues. And, um, and then, uh, I also think that uh, that there's an going to be a, a big opportunity, as Tavi pointed out, in, in in some of these commodities, particular silver and gold, and you have to be sensitive to the fact that that idea is finally starting to work. Um, the equities are depressed. Um, no one in Americans tend not to perceive a need for that. Those sorts of issues is another reason why they're dirt cheap. But if they start to move, they could have tremendous runs. So I think I would I would want to be focused on both of those kinds of things for opportunities. Not to say there aren't other opportunities elsewhere, but but those are those are the things that are matter most to me right now. Excellent, thank you. And then Tavi, the same question. Um, you can talk about something we didn't get a chance to talk about, and or you know what should we as investors be looking at twelve to twenty four months from now. I'll try to keep it short in the uh, uh, Bill well said. I, I was going to say, well, look, I think there's pockets of volatilities in the market that are, are very cheap right now. And I think we're back to the old days of macro where volatility of FX will be uh, reestablished uh, in, in a way where interest rates just staying higher than, than uh, you know, than, than usual uh, will cause uh, we're going back to the 90s and 80s of those of those markets, and uh, there's going to be opportunities on depagging of currencies and other issues. Um, I I also think that the cost of capital being higher uh, will change the dynamic of of how we value uh, assets. And if you're you know if you're in the markets and you're looking for that skill set that are going to be uh, demanding in the following decade, I think value investing is is going to be one of them. And so you you really want to understand. Uh, how to value businesses, and and the second thing is 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 valuing emerging markets. I think that has been a forgotten part of the market. Uh, we didn't talk much about Brazil, but I think Brazilian equities are, you know, one of the most uh, uh, interesting places to be invested today. And you can find commodity related businesses, but you can also find indirect businesses like banks. 
Uh, there are, as I said before, very established uh, companies uh, that can do very well in this environment, and and I I really like those. And so, um, you know, those are those are my big my big uh, uh, things. I think Jim Grant one time said, uh, you know, investing is about uh, agreeing not agreeing with investors today, but it, uh, investors agreeing with your thesis in the future. And um, there's certainly no shortage of those uh, right now. And you know, metals and mining is just one of them, but it's you know, for folks that are looking for those skill sets that are likely to be demanding, I think agricultural commodities can be a great one. Energy can be a good one. Uranium could be another one. There's so many ways to kind of skin the cat here to uh, to make money in this in kind of hard asset environment. And so, um, I, I'm very, uh, um, you know, I'm very focused in that part of the of of the global economy because I think it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be a great way to make uh, uh, wealth in the near future. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you both gentlemen for taking your time out today. I know your time is valuable. I appreciate it. I know the listeners appreciate it. Um, Follow both of these guys on Twitter. They put out a lot of good information. And uh, with that, I will uh, see everybody next Wednesday. Thank you again, everybody for attending. And thank you gentlemen for being here. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Bill. Take care. Uh